party, please? Steve McGonigal. He's over here. Okay, okay. <laughs> you may have to tell me that once more than once. Yeah. Steve. <laughs> Good. I'll need that. Go to my fingers. <laughs> Trust me, I need that prompting. Okay. All right, Steve. Um, a large part of your story involves discussions of eyewitness testimony, in particular a phenomenon that's sometimes called a Shoah. Tell us what that is, how it's used, and why it can be problematic. Well, a show-up identification is something that's been used by law enforcement in this country for hundreds of years. It's nothing more complicated than uh, someone becomes a victim of a crime. Uh, usually it's a street kind of crime, an assault of some kind, uh, or a robbery is another common form, and they will um, make an outcry to uh, someone on the street, a police officer, and say, something along the lines of I've just been robbed or just been mugged and the guy who did this uh, just ran off in that direction and the police officer will then try to apprehend that individual who's been described to him sometimes in pretty generic terms as close to the scene as is possible. So show-ups tend to occur on the street shortly after a crime has taken place and based on a, a very uh, scant description of who the um, who the offender may have been. The police officer will then typically, if they can find someone, will um, take someone, take them back to the scene where the crime took place or take them back to where the witness is and then ask the witness, is this the person who committed this crime against you? So how they differ from other kinds of identifications is it's just one person. It's, it's also referred to sometimes as a one person lineup. So it's on, your choice if you're the victim is either it's this person or it's not. You don't have anything to compare it to um, and it is done in such close proximity to the crime itself both in terms of, of time and location that the person could have just literally been victimized you know, minutes before they're being asked, is this the person who committed this crime against you? So it is something that has gone on in American law enforcement for a long, long time and continues to today even though the lineup procedure, the multiple six-person lineup is far more common. Uh, why, why is it problematic in a way? The, the, the problem with show-ups is the nature, how suggestive they are. Once again, you're talking about somebody who has, if you're doing this the way they're normally done, which is in, in, a, in a very short time after the event, it's often someone who is pretty traumatized by what's happened to them. And they've just told the police, you know, the guy who did this to me just ran off that away. So they, they very much want the crime to be resolved. I mean, the, it's, it's kind of a heat of the moment deal. And the problem is that a police officer brings someone back to you. You want very much to have the crime solved. You're the one who has, after all, sent the police officer after this person. You want to, you want to help the police to, to solve the crime. So when they bring someone back, you have, witnesses sometimes have a tendency to want to, be, to, want to please, please the police officer by saying, well, this must be the guy. I mean, he's the guy the police are bringing back in front of me. There must be a reason why they brought this guy in front of me as opposed to anybody else. So there is a, a tendency to want to agree with the police officer much more than in a regular lineup situation where you have people to compare to and say, well, that kind of looks like him, but I'm not sure that's him. You don't necessarily have that when it's just a one-on-one -on -one kind of situation. So where, where problems come in is where people get kind of caught up in the moment. The, the, uh, the emotions of the moment, the desire to please the police officers, and the police officers sometimes, depending on how they conduct these things, the show-ups will be done with the guy in handcuffs. The show-ups will be done sometimes with the guy sitting in a police car. And again, it is the, the tendency is for the victim to think they've got the right guy, they wouldn't have brought him in front of me if they didn't have the right guy, so um, close enough. So that looks like the guy who did this, the police must think it's him, I'll go ahead and say it's him. Right, those things sort of implicate guilt. They do, yeah. they do. They indicate, they indicate that this is the guy. Okay, thank you. Um, talk about the way, oh, wrong question. In an earlier interview, you said you didn't want this story to be an archeological dig. Yes. What did you mean by that and how did you avoid it? There's been a lot written about DNA exonerations over the last few years. We have more than 200 of them around the country and reporters have been writing about this for a long, long time. Our task was to take what we had and to try to do something different with it. We had already, each of us, my 
partner Jen Emily and I had both done individual stories about people who had been exonerated, examining that particular case, writing stories about you know how this person felt to be freed after all these years. Um, that is kind of the typical approach that reporters have taken to these DNA exonerations is doing them on an individual basis. What we wanted to do was to look at not only the things that led to these particular cases, but to try to figure out what the lessons were from all of these exonerations that could be carried forward, that could tell us about the way things are going today. We did not want anyone to be able to say to us, as we knew they would, well, that was then, this is now. We don't have these problems anymore because now we have DNA, and so we don't run into the same kind of problems that they ran into prior to DNA. We knew intrinsically, inherently, that that was not the case, but we also knew that's what people were going to say to us. So we wanted to be able to say, okay, we know that this case is a 1985 case, and there was no DNA available at that time, but the procedures that were used in this case, the identification procedures, for example, are virtually identical to what we're still doing today. And it was that identification that led to this person being arrested in the first place. So what have we done really here to prevent this kind of thing from happening in the future? So that's why I say we didn't want to do an archaeological dig. We didn't want this to just be a historic thing that people could say, uh, that's in the past, we don't have those problems anymore. We wanted to be able to say, if you look at these things, um, as a group, you can see the same kind of patterns emerging from them that still exist today, and what have we really done to address those patterns? And the answer in the case of eyewitness identifications is not much. Uh, let me just check my timing real quick. 